So it's three o'clock, so I think we're gonna get started now. Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much for braving the weather outside to make it here today. I've heard it's gotten particularly nasty out there, so thank you for that. Um, this is the second lightning talk in the Digital Matters Lab. I'm Rebecca Cummings, I'm the Research Data Management Librarian here in the Marriott Library. And today we're gonna do an introduction to digital humanities tools. Uh, the way this is going to work is we have six presenters, uh, each of whom are going to take 10 minutes to talk about a tool that supports the digital humanities. Since we only have 10 minutes, we probably won't, you, know, you won't walk away knowing everything there is to know about the tools we're going to cover, but hopefully at least you get an idea of what kind of tools are being used and their capabilities, and maybe um, if they'll be useful in your research. So this is the list of tools and speakers that we have for today. Uh, Brian McBride is going to start us off by talking about WordPress. After that, we're going to hear from Justin Sorensen, who is our local GIS expert to talk about ArcGIS and Google Earth. Elizabeth Calloway will talk about R. Anna Nietrauer will talk about Omeka. Um, I'm going to cover Zotero, and Lisa Swanstrom is going to talk about Voyant. Um, since we do have six speakers, um, I'm going to ask you to hold your questions until the end, just to make sure we give everyone their time, and then we should have about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A afterwards. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Brian McBride. And I'll get your slides queued up. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks for inviting me back to talk today. Um, as some of you might know, before I get started with WordPress, um, we actually have a team of developers here at the library specifically dedicated to um, digital infrastructure development, be it um, our repositories, our WordPress instance, or any other type of digital humanities or other type of projects we're working on. We're actually working on a data repository right now with Rebecca and the data repository team. Um, so without ado, just want to let everybody know about that and let's talk about WordPress. Um, so WordPress didn't really start as a blog. It was intended to start as like updating typography. And you can actually read about the history right there. Um, but moving forward, some people might not know what WordPress really is. Some people think it's a blog. It has blogging capabilities. But what it really is is it's a content management system that's highly pluggable. It's almost like an application development framework in its essence. Um, so I mean, some of the things that we use it for here at the library for blogging, we do some publishing. I can talk about a project we did later. Um, content management, and that's where the core of the system is. It's also the application platform, and you can really do a lot more than what's just listed here. So to give some people some context, I went through and found some notable websites that actually utilize WordPress as their uh, infrastructure. Um, we actually wrote um, with a team um, here a project with Ms. Batten, um, The Ethics of Suicide. It's actually a handbook. Um, and it was published by Oxford University Press. And on top of that, there's actually the online component of the book that has a lot of additional material that wasn't put in the published edition. Um, there's also markup and linkings so that there's a sort of a community there that people can ask questions and make it a little bit more interactive. Some flexibility that you don't necessarily have in traditional publishing. So this is the Chicago Sun-Times, the Prime Minister of India's official website, I thought that was pretty cool, the Georgia State University, the National Health Services Leadership Academy in the UK. Um, always uh, give a, a mention to the schools in Boston. The MIT Sloan <laughs> Management Review, sort of an inside joke. Um, <laughs> Time and then Inc. So I mean, you can see there's a wide range of uh, corporations or institutions or organizations who actually utilize WordPress. Um, not necessarily in its traditional sense, but um, they're using it and these are very highly uh, um, sought after sites that get a lot of users. So you might be asking what can you do with WordPress here at the university as digital humanities or just in general? So you can really do pretty much a lot of things. Um, some of the things that I came up with that uh, might be helpful to give some people some ideas to start off with. Um, if you just want to throw up a website, you know, there, there's tons of platforms out there to do websites. WordPress gives you some functionality that you wouldn't necessarily get with just using static HTML um, or using Dreamweaver or any other type of uh, application. So you can do forums. Forums might be a good place to bounce ideas off each other, sort of get an interactive community going a little bit um, that's very specific to your needs. Um, the content distribution, I think this is a pretty excellent uh, opportunity to use WordPress for actually distributing content. Um, E-commerce, not sure if that's reflective on uh, our community in academia per se, but there is a, 
a wide variety of e-commerce systems that tie into WordPress seamlessly. Um, online communities, surveys, mailing lists, um, do more tr digital publications, and a lot more. This is really just a, a very small subset of what you can actually do with this platform. Um, what do you get need? <laughs> what do you need to get started with WordPress? You know, some people are a little bit hesitant. They, they might go hear WordPress. They don't really understand what it is, or they don't know how to get started with it. They might say they might have much technical expertise, but the reality is to get a basic WordPress site up and going, it doesn't require that much expertise. And in fact, um, this is essentially all you need. And the fourth one being the uh, necessary requirement um, is time and energy. As with um, anything, learning something new takes a bit of time and devotion and dedication. And <laughs> so anybody can take this, if you do have these four requirements met, you could head over to WordPress.com and they actually provide a very basic um, setup of WordPress that's free for anyone to use. They do have a pricing model that if you require certain functionality that's not on the free model, you can actually um, pay, and it's not too much money, just a few bucks a month to actually have the increased um, functionality. Um, the other thing too is we at the library um, with some other departments here in the library are actually looking into, we have an instance of WordPress, a multi-site instance that we're using um, that we'd like to talk about some potential partnerships with other people in the uh, University of Utah community. So if you have any questions, uh, you feel free to contact me, either technical, logistical, just wanna send an email. Um, yeah, and if there's any questions at the end of the, the meeting, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Brian. Justin, you're up next. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be briefly introducing you to a couple of tools that we utilize in the realm of GIS. Uh, ArcGIS and Google Earth are tools utilized for the visualization of data and the creation of geospatial projects. Both programs fall under the broad field of visualization software known as GIS, which stands for Geographic Information Systems or in more recent trends being referred to as geospatial information systems. At its core, GIS platforms allow for the visualization, analysis, and interpretation of data in order to geospatially understand relationships, patterns, and trends in data through the development and presentation of cartographic maps, interactive mapping platforms, and geospatial infographics. GIS programs such as these accomplish this by incorporating multiple layers which when brought together, create a geospatial project and visualization that expresses and enhances data through the presentation of visual resources. Within the service of digital humanities, GIS plays an important role in the research, visualization, and project development of students, staff, faculty, and researchers in several ways. First, GIS creates an improved communication of information. Statistical charts, spreadsheets, and raw data comprehensible by individuals in select fields can now be visualized and presented in a geospatial format that allows others outside of these fields the opportunity to interact with, interpret, and draw conclusions from. GIS-based maps and visualizations greatly assist in understanding situations and in the storytelling process. Many of the projects and research topics fall under this definition, allowing viewers the ability to visualize events and information at the heart of projects, to relay thoughts, ideas, and interpretations in ways text cannot. GIS establishes a universal language between multiple disciplines, departments, professional fields, organizations, and the public. It's been said that a picture can paint a thousand words. So in the case of GIS, a picture is painted that geospatially represents discipline-specific data and information on demand that others can quickly access, understand, and interpret. Finally, GIS allows for the visualization and display of many types of data and can be used as a comparative and analytical tool for discovering how information relates. It's for these reasons that there are very few types of information that cannot be expressed geospatially using geospatial platforms such as these making them an excellent resource for presenting and visualizing information in a creative and innovative manner. 
Through the conversion of data into geospatial visualization, GIS programs such as ArcGIS and Google Earth enable users with the ability to share information quickly and visually through the creation of maps and projects, while simultaneously sharing many factors about the data that might otherwise be overlooked. ArcGIS and Google Earth differ in their functionality and ability to share information with others. Google Earth is the introductory program that I encourage individuals pursuing their first geospatial program to consider due to its user-friendly interface and ability to share information through a free downloadable platform. Google Earth offers the ability to create basic location information, visualize statistical information, and generate geospatial projects while taking advantage of high-resolution satellite imagery and three-dimensional technology. ArcGIS is a professional level subscription-based platform which expands upon the features found in Google Earth with the incorporation of comparative and analytical tools for research and development. Because ArcGIS is so vast, here at the Marriott Library, we offer support and assistance to students, staff, and faculty in the creation of geospatial projects. Meaning, even if you don't have experience with GIS projects or programs, but have an interest in adding that to a project you're working on. We're here to help you with develop those skills through a collaborative development of your project. So you may be wondering, how does the output of this platform appear when it's actually in practice? Let's first look at how Google Earth can enhance the presentation and display of information. Consider a project that contains a collection of historical photographs. Now there's certainly an option where you could take these images, put them on a website, and allow others to access them in that manner. But why not add a geospatial component to them by locating each image on an interactive map, displaying them side by side with an image of a current location, the same location, while presenting all the information that you wish to present to the user at a click of a button. Or perhaps you're examining environmental impacts and a document is just not enough to express the seriousness of what is taking place. Creating a geospatial visualization representing your information can be just, one of the, just the way to go in order to capture the viewer's attention, relay the information, and examine the content in greater detail. Let's now bring in the professional ArcGIS platform for an analytical and comparative functionality. Take, for example, a spreadsheet of data that represents nuclear test detonations that were conducted in Nevada and the numerical impacts for fallout that have resulted throughout Utah. Through the conversion of data to a geospatial visualization, we quickly gain a clear understanding of the data extent being represented and the events as they progress. In addition, we develop an understanding of the information being focused on by examining the level of detail being presented what information is being presented through descriptive titles and narratives, as well as a breakdown of statistical information through visual th and thematic color schemes available on demand. The creation of analytical components representing your information can easily lead to the development of full-scale digital projects and a continued pursuit of research and learning. So in conclusion, GIS programs such as these are very beneficial for sharing data and resources geospatially while taking research projects to a new level. The diversity of projects and disciplines utilizing GIS platforms demonstrates a wide variety of possibilities for future research, project development, and collaborations that students, faculty, and researchers are able to utilize within their research endeavors. And as our world continues converting towards a digital realm, GIS will continue to be one of the many tools available to assist in geospatially sharing and visualizing information while aiding researchers in achieving their project goals. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Justin. Okay, Lizzie, come on up. Hi, I'm Lizzie. I'm gonna talk to you about R today. R is a um, programming language and a software environment that's designed to facilitate uh, statistical analysis of data and then visualization of that data. So I'm gonna walk away, but I'm gonna keep projecting. Uh, this, this is what it looks like to work in R uh, through R Studio, one of the common interfaces used for R. This is where you'd be entering your code. Right here in the R console is where 
the results, lots and lots of errors would pop up. <laughs> and then here's where any visuals you created would um, appear. And here I've just mapped the occurrence of the word tool, the relative frequency of the word tools in 60 documents which all belong to the what is digital humanities genre. So perhaps uh, today's definition and, and exploration of tools is a good place to start when talking about digital humanities. You'll see that tools appears in nearly every definitional statement, um, something that's not true for things like uh, this is the word gender <clears throat> yet. Um, so what can you do in R? R does a lot of things that other programs will let you do perhaps more easily with less of a learning curve in starting up. Um, you could go to places like Lexos, which will let you do things like um, visualize your text with relative word frequencies, word trees, those kinds of things. R can do that. Lexos is an, is, is an easier place to start. You could go to raw density design, which lets you uh, visualize things in plots like um, scatter plots, histograms, all sorts of um, types of charts that you've never even heard of before and probably don't need to use. <laughs> um, you can go to Palladio, which will let you visualize networks on top of maps and then slide those ne networks through time um, to look at networks through time. R can do that too. Um, you could go to a plugin for Zotero, uh, Paper Machines, which lets you topic model things. So one of the ways to go about gaining uh, facility with digital humanities tools is to start with tools like these, and then when you get to places where you want them to do things that they can't do for you, you need to uh, specialize them, then you can go pick up uh, a programming language like R or Java or something to um, specialize what you're doing. So what can you do with R? All sort of, of text mining applications. Um, word counts, relative fre frequencies of words. Uh, you can do uh, word cloud visualizations. You could print keywords in context. So if I want to know uh, how tools is being used in my corpus, I can go look at the 10 words or 30 words before and after each use of the word tools so I know if people are saying tools are bad, we never use them in digital humanities, <laughs> or if they're saying that they indeed use tools. Um, you can do things like sentiment analysis, which someone talked about last time, which uh, puts a numerical value on certain words, um, indicating um, either positive or negative sentiments. Words like best, awesome, would get a positive um, numerical value and worst. And, and so on, you can do topic modeling, which in which you ask the computer to locate, to, to put together words that tend to co-occur in texts. Um, you can also do all sorts of visualizations in plots, histograms, scatter, pl scatter plots, Vernoy, um, alluvial, Sankey diagrams, stream graphs. Um, and you also can do mapping and network analysis. So what can you do with R? You can generate data and visualize it. You're really only limited by what people have written packages to do. And then if you get really good, you're only limited, <laughs> you're only limited by what kind of packages you yourself can write for R. I don't do that yet. <laughs> um, one of the big names in digital humanities who is using R uh, for literary analysis is, of course, Matthew Jockers. Uh, in addition, he's written a book uh, for literary scholars who want to learn R, so that he has a kind of foundational textbook in methods in R for students of literature. So here you can see, for example, he's um, plotted the word romance in British novel titles um, over time. He's working with a corpus of over 3,000 novels, and um, I'll just show you a series of diagrams from uh, micro macro analysis. Um, here's the usage of the word beautiful in British and American novels by decades. So this isn't just the titles, this is the, in the texts of the novels themselves. And um, he could then perhaps construct an argument about this shift over here, or things like that. Here's a figure generated in R about genre signals through time. So you have percentage of novels published, um, which percentage, how, what percentage of novels published fall into each of these genres, like Gothic, historical novel, The Buildings Roman, et cetera. He does topic modeling in R. So here's a topic of words that tend to co-occur to together that he's labeled the Ireland theme. Um, Pretty obvious there. And uh, then you can look at those themes through time. So here is a different topic, tenants and landlords, and how it appears through time for uh, three different nations of literature. So you have the um, American is the black line, uh, Irish is the light, 
gray line, which you can't really distinguish very well on the screen, from the British medium gray line, which is the uh, more steady line without all the peaks and valleys. Um, so then he could start looking at uh, topics compared across types of novels he has. Um, I'm going to go back one. The interesting thing about this Jockers book is that it's not really any one diagram that you look at that makes a really powerful argument um, that you say, aha, that's, that's where it at, it's at. The way I look at novels has changed. Rather, it's sort of a slow accretion of different kinds of um, figures that he puts up that really start to make an argument about how texts resemble each other, whether it's by genre or nation or author, and how we recognize them as being related to each other. Other people are doing network analysis with R. Um, here we have Yan Cheng Zhao, who has done um, a reading of the uh, handle R data mining and what, people, uh, what words people tend to use when they um, call out or uh, tag that handle or write from that account. Um, and while it doesn't really make sense to topic model a 140 character <laughs> tweet, um, you can see that words that tend to occur together are placed closer together on the network and have more connections. So you can start to analyze vast bodies of things like tweets. You can also uh, map things on um, the globe. <laughs> we just talked about GIS, but R can do some of that as well. Here, uh, he has mapped the, the um, followers of the R data mining um, handle so that you can start to think about who's um, following R data mining, I guess. Um, you can also do kind of heat maps on real maps. And uh, this, uh, I don't really know what the argument is behind this because this is just an example from uh, one of the many guides to R on, available online, but here it is the 1923 winter market and how many buyers are uh, in each state. So if you have a type of question that could be answered um, by kind of a diffusion um, uh, across space, then perhaps you could use this. Um, all in all, R is an incredibly versatile tool that can be used to answer a variety of questions. Um, there is, like any programming language, a really steep learning curve, um, but then once you learn it to do, say, one type of analysis, like topic modeling, it's then easier to say, now I want to do mapping, I know the basics, um, I can do nearly anything given my, my language facility now. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Anna, you're up. All right. Um, so I'm going to cover Omeka today. And before I get started, I just want a quick show of hands. Has anybody used Omeka before? Only Rebecca, oh, got like two people? OK, so this will be review for some of you, um, but hopefully not too much. Um, and I'm Anna. I'm a metadata librarian here. So I'm going to just go over some of the basics. What is it? Why might you be interested in it? I'm going to touch a little bit on customizations and ways to extend Omeka functionality. I'm going to show some examples of interesting Omeka projects. Um, I'm going to try to do live demos. We'll see how that works. Um, and I'm going to focus on um, some projects that were done mostly by undergraduates in Omeka, because I think it can be a really powerful platform for that kind of work. And I'll also highlight um, some resources for learning more. So, what it is, it's a web publishing tool, and it's developed by the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University, which is you know, the juggernaut digital humanities center that also has developed tools uh, such as Press Forward, Zotero. Uh, it supports the um, September 11th archive and much, 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 much more. Um, they have a, a list of great suggestions for ways that you might use Omeka split up between different disciplines. But three things that I just wanted to highlight are um, support, supporting um, student scholarship, creating attractive visual displays of digital collection materials, and also it can be used as a platform for creating and publishing digital scholarship. Um, librarians love Venn diagrams, so giving an opportunity to include one in a presentation, we will. And this might be, unfortunately, a little bit hard to read, but I wanted to highlight this because this is how Omeka positions itself in the tech ecosystem. And it's at this intersection 
of things like web content management systems like WordPress, which we just talked about, also um, museum collection management systems, and uh, library digital collections and repository systems. And you'll see there, Omeka's like kind of a tiny piece of all of those things, but it doesn't do everything that all of these systems do. So what is it not for? It's not really a full-fledged content or digital asset management system. Um, for example, in the library community, I don't really know of any library that only uses Omeka for their digital collections. They usually use some other main software platform, like we used to use ContentDM, uh, which we're not using anymore, and then they export that data, um, selected data for use in Omeka. Um, another thing that I really want to highlight is that it's not a digital preservation system. So if you're using it for work and you, you're putting your content up on the web, it's not going to stay there perfectly preserved forever. You still need to um, work on preserving your materials, and that's something that um, we in the library can help you out with. If you have high resolution TIFFs or some images that you're using in your scholarship, Maybe you're creating an Omeka site for a class, but you also want to make sure that those materials are preserved for the long term. I'd encourage you to check in with the library about that. This is just a very quick look at what it looks like to edit an item in Omeka. I just took this off of our sandbox, sandbox instance of it. If you're comfortable using a word processor, if you're comfortable doing any web publishing like blogging or posting to Facebook, you can basically figure out how to add content to Omeka and how to edit content um, once it's in Omeka. So I'm going to talk now about some different projects and kind of highlight how Omeka can be configured to look um, very different depending on the kinds of uses that you're envisioning for it and also give you an idea of the breadth of what it can be used for. So um, this is my appeal to authority. This is an exhibit that I put together. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to click through to that, but um, I put together an exhibit for the Civilian Conservation Corps for the Digital Public Library of America. And they have dozens of exhibits on different historical topics that are all developed in Omeka. And they also have sets of primary source materials for K through 12 teachers. And all of those are curated within Omeka as well. Okay, going north, this is another awesome exhibit, um, and that was done by a combined um, graduate and undergraduate class, and this focuses on oral histories. So you can click through and listen to different oral histories that are tagged at different times and learn about the stories of people um, who migrated to Philadelphia. Omeka has a lot of plugins, just as Brian was talking about plugins um, with WordPress. There's the same kind of thing here. So often when you're thinking about a project, um, there are ways to extend the functionality to make uploading into Omeka easier, um, to make some of the backend collection management easier. And you'll see here, there's also some plugins right here for text analysis and uh, text annotation. One of the most popular plugins is Neatline. Um, and this is something that allows you to do some basic mapping um, and create some stories to tell with maps and timelines. So one example here, what I'm highlighting is a exhibit on a sentimental journey by an undergraduate at the University of Virginia. It's just going to try and like actually bring it up. Yay! Okay, here we go. Um, so here we can see there's some text along the side and then there's a nice timeline going ahead as you move forward in the novel and then some of the points in the novel as well. You, those are then expressed on a map. You can get quotes from the text and then also some extra explanatory text. So that's a nice way to do sort of a deep dive into a work of literature that is moving through space and time in a visual way, um, and that's an undergraduate student project. So that can be like a really interesting capstone um, for someone if you're thinking of using this in the classroom.
And another one that I'm going to go to directly, um, what I'm trying to get to, this is one of my um, kind of favorite public digital humanities sites. This is the R Marathon Project, which is at Northeastern, so Boston, Brian. Um, and they have a variety of exhibits and things up dealing with Neatline. I'm going to see if I can navigate to the map um, that I was trying to get to. Um, you'll see here they have some maps with some of their um, contributions put up. And here's an example, again, of a Neatline exhibit put together by an undergraduate student. So we'll see if that loads. So. A map doesn't necessarily have to be a geospatial map. So in this case, this is a poster of messages that were left after the Boston bombing. And they've used Neatline, this mapping and visualization tool, to pick out themes in the map. And that can serve as a window to items in their digital collection. So you can highlight over here and pick out um, different themes. I've now like moved in so close. But now I've highlighted just things that are focused on the theme of like Boston Strong. And then that can be like a jumping off point to go in and explore all of these messages that they have tagged in their archive on that theme. So that's just another use of Neatline, um, how you can use mapping for things that are not necessarily geospatial, but also give people a different way of browsing that collection of archival materials. Another um, plugin that I'm very intrigued by is Scripto, which is a plugin that works um, both with WordPress and Omeka, and it leverages Wikimedia or wiki editing software to give you a platform for doing crowdsourced transcriptions. And you can see the value of that if you're dealing with materials with um, incredibly messy handwriting. Often we do not have the skills to read incredibly messy handwriting anymore or even just incredibly legible cursive handwriting. Um, so that can be a way of um, bringing in more functionalities to some text that you want to analyze. And then after you go through some things and transcribe text using Scripto, then you could go ahead and use some text visualization on it once you have that captured. So there are a few resources for learning more. Um, I really like the lessons on Omeka that are up at the Programming Historian, if you haven't checked that out yet. And there's quite a few screencasts and other resources for getting started with Omeka. And if you have qu any questions for me, really feel free to let me know. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. I am doing lots of live demos, so now I'm a little bit nervous. All right, so um, hello again. Uh, Rebecca Cummings, data management librarian here. And I'm gonna talk about Zotero, which is another really great tool that was developed at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University, just like Omeka. Um, and the way that I think of Zotero is it really is like a life hack for organizing all the digital content in your life. Um, I think we're gonna start off by talking about a problem. And that problem is, is that we are taking, it, taking in information from all over the place. Um, as researchers, we often start our projects by thinking about um, our literature reviews, thinking about just the entire landscape of what's been said about a topic that we're interested in or a project that we're working on. And so we often get to work looking at things like databases, hopefully checking your library catalog, maybe looking at irregular sources like YouTube or blog, blogs, or maybe even an email exchange you had with a colleague. So we've really, we're in this environment now where we are getting data and information from all over the place. And organizing that content can be a bit of a challenge. And so Zotero is a tool that really helps you um, kind of wrangle your, your research resources. So, so what is it? Uh, Zotero is free open source software that helps you collect, organize, share, and cite your references and your research resources. Um, what I love about it, um, above other tools, is that it allows you to work in the browser. So some tools are now incorporating this as well, but when we're doing our research, when we're looking for our resources, what we're often doing is looking in a browser, something like Chrome or Safari or Internet Explorer or Firefox. And Zotero works right in there so you can save things with the click of a button when you find them. Um, it's really great for collaborative work, so if you want to start a shared library and work with a co-author, for instance, if you have a library where you can both put content in there, you can do that. 
It's great for note taking and creating annotated bibliographies or tagging content with words you'd like to tag it with. Um, and probably most important, it's really great at automating your citation work. So citation work, you know, creating your bibliography, um, it's kind of, uh, it can be drudgery if you're doing this stuff by hand or even cutting and pasting it. So it allows you to automate that work and make it go a lot faster. There are three components of Zotero, and sometimes this is the learning curve that people have to get over when they're adopting this technology. Um, the first is Zotero.org. That's where you go to download the software and set up your online account. Um, it's also where you go if you need help troubleshooting or want to do some online discussions to figure out how to use the tool better. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is uh, an application or a plugin that you use to manage your library, and that's going to be Zotero for Firefox or Zotero Standalone. And I'm going to show you what those things look like. Um, and then the third thing is Zotero plugin for Word. And that is how your reference library is going to talk to your Word documents when you need to plug those sources into your paper. So if it seems confusing, it's actually really not all that bad. And we're going to walk through that momentarily. Um, in the next, you know, probably seven minutes or so, I'm going to demonstrate just the main uh, capacity of Zotero. We're not going to look at everything Zotero does, um, but I'm going to show you how to set up your account and how to install Zotero. Uh, how to add references to your Zotero library, how to then plug those references into a Word document, and then how to set and change your document preferences. Um, there's a lot more you can do with Zotero, but I think if you're just getting started, that's probably the place you're going to start. Okay, Anna, let's, here's hoping this works. Okay, so I'm gonna go to Firefox first. Okay, good, you can see that, that's great. Um, and the reason I'm going to Firefox is because Firefox is an open source browser that tends to work best with open source tools. You can use it in other browsers, but I've found that it's the least buggy and has the most functionality if you work in Firefox. So we're going to go to Zotero.org. Um, I'm going to log out because I want to see it the way you would if it were the first time you were looking at it. What you would do first is you're going to register for an online account just like you would many other things online. You'll create a username, you'll give them your email address, and create a password. And you'll prove you're not a robot. And that will get you your Zotero account. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to download Zotero. And what you're actually downloading is one of two things. You're either going to download Zotero for Firefox, which is the plugin you use in the Firefox browser, or Zotero Standalone, which is an application that works with Firefox, Chrome, or Safari, but not Internet Explorer because of the crazy proprietary things attached to Microsoft products. Um, but like I said, I use Firefox, and so that's what we're going to look at today. But either of them work exceptionally well. Don't worry too much about which one that you use. Just pick one and stick with it. So I'm going to log back in as me. And you probably can't see this great, but what you're looking at here is my library. It does live in the back end of Zotero. Um, and then other things that you can do here, you can create groups if you want to work with people. You can find really good documentation. But that's pretty much all you do in this Zotero.org. Where you're actually going to do your work is uh, the application or the plugin. And here, because the plugin lives in Firefox, it lives at the very top of my browser. It looks like a little Z up there. And when I click on it, my library shows up. Um, if you hadn't yet synced your library, because we're assuming that this is the first time you've ever used it, you would go to Preferences, you'd go to Sync, and you would just add the username and password that you just created in Zotero.org. And now your application is synced to the back end of Zotero. Okay. So this is my library of uh, something like 3,400 digital objects that I've collected over the years that are of interest to me. Um, right now, we're going to pretend we're starting a new research project, and we're going to call it Digital Humanities and Libraries. That seems appropriate for today. So now I've started this new collection. Um, over here, sorry, Angela, I'm going to walk away for a second, but I'll be right back. So over here is where you see your entire library. In the middle is where you see objects that are inside of your collection. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you're going to see the metadata attached to each individual item. So if you click on it, that's when you see things like item type, the title, the author, the abstract, the URL, and lots and lots of information. The quality of the metadata is going to be completely based on the quality of the resource that you're using. So if you find a resource, for instance, in our library catalog, odds are it's going to have really wonderful, robust, well-structured metadata. Um, if you find it on YouTube, it might be less so. But you can go in and edit that metadata as you need to. 
So today we're going to add three items to our collection, and I'm going to show you how to uh, plug those into a Word document. So let's go back to our right now empty library, uh, Digital Humanities and Libraries. I'm going to bring that down because I want to be able to do some searching. And I'm going to start where I'm sure all of you do when you do your research. I'm going to start at lib.utah.edu, which is a wonderful place to start your research. We're going to go to the search bar here and look up digital humanities, oops, which is misspelled twice because I get nervous in front of people. Digital humanities and I'm just going to do this asterisk. It's a library trick. You can ask later if you're curious about that. Um, so here we can see lots of great information, lots of great resources. And let's go ahead and save a couple. We're going to assume we've actually read through them and, and said, okay, yes, that is what I'm looking for. Let's click on this one, Digital Humanities in the Library. And up in the toolbar next to that Z where you're doing, you know, that's where your Zotero lives, there's a little book icon. If you click on that, it just grabbed that resource and added it to your library. It's that easy. It's one click to add these things to your resource library. We're going to do another search, and let's grab one more thing. Um, this is a really positive title, Working Together or Apart, Promoting the Next Generation of Digital Scholarship. So if we clicked on that, again, let's click on that book icon, and now we've grabbed two things for that library. Now, just to show you this doesn't just work in library interfaces, let's go to the NewYorkTimes.com, and let's do a search again. Digital Humanities Library. And lots of interesting stories there, but let's grab this one. Digital Humanities boots up on some campuses, just like it is here at the University of Utah. And when you see a little newspaper icon show up next to the Z, you click on that as well. So now we've got this little collection that we just created, three different items related to digital humanities. You probably can't see them from where you're sitting, but that's fine. Um, probably the most important thing to notice, though, if you can see it, is that there's really great structured information here that Zotero just pulled off the web, metadata that was embedded on those different websites. Um, if we click on this one right here, this was the newspaper article, all the metadata is right there on the right. If you found something in that article, like a quote that you really wanted to capture or, you know, a statistic that you wanted to keep, that's something you could add in the notes section in Zotero. It would show up as a child record underneath the metadata record. Um, New York Times does a great job tagging all their articles, so these tags are already embedded. If you wanted to add more tags, you could do that. Um, if you found an article that maybe related really well to something else that you read, you can relate those two articles together so that they show up kind of in conjunction with one another. So there's a lot of functionality here right in uh, the application. But let's go do the thing that almost everyone does when they're working in Zotero, and that's plugging those citations now into your paper. Okay, so let's go to Word. Let me minimize this. I'm going to go to Word. Okay, let's create a document now. Um, so let's pretend we're going to start writing our paper. So let's, what's a nice thing we can say? I'll make this bigger for you guys. Okay, I'm going to keep my notes right here. Okay, so let's say libraries and DH are natural partners. And then we're going to plug our citations in. So you go to the little scroll. This is Zotero in Word. Go to Zotero, add citation. We're going to pick our citation style, so I use APA, but of course you could pick one of many citation styles. And then you do, you're going to search digital, humanities, and libraries. Let's see what pops up. Okay, that's, that's the citation I want, I click on that. And even if you only remembered a tiny bit, if you remembered a phrase from the article, if you remembered a piece of the title, the author's name, let's say you only remembered it was in the New York Times, you could search by any of those things and you can find it in your Zotero library. And it automatically plugs into your Word document. Let's do another one. So, libraries produce digital content. And let's do another search. So Zotero, add citation. And we'll do the same search since we know it's in the Digital Humanities folder. Let's see what pops up. Uh, that one looks good. Oh, click. And there it is. And let's just do our last one. So, um, working together is better than working alone. 
This isn't very good paper, but that's okay. That's not really the point. So Zotero, add citation, and now we're gonna look up, there was that clear article we found, I think it was actually called Working Together, maybe? Yeah, there it is, Working Together or Apart. So we found it, let's plug that in. And now, once you're done with your paper, what you would do is just go Zotero, add bibliography, and I'm gonna minimize this so you can see it better. Now the bibliography automatically shows up in your document, which is just really, really fantastic. But you can see just by this how easy it is to, to capture your citations, to plug them into your documents. You can do lots of other things like learning how to annotate your bibliographies. You can share resources much easier. But bottom line is this work just shouldn't be done by hand because it's super easy. And actually, I think my 10 minutes are up. Oh, nope, it's not me yet. And our next presenter, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Swanstrom. Right. Um, thank you so much for having me. This is such a great um, series. Um, I'm very excited about it. And um, my name is Lisa Swanstrom. I'm a professor in the English department. And before I start, I'd just like to make a, a short plug. Uh, some of you may have already heard from me um, about uh, the critical digital humanities research interest group um, that we're hoping to um, revive this spring. And if you're interested at all in participating, either by uh, reading works together or sharing works in progress, um, please be in touch. My uh, email will be at the end of the, this presentation. Also, um, David uh, Rowe started um, a digital humanities website for the U, and we're expanding that. So if you have any news items or events that you think would be um, useful to disseminate, please be in touch. We'd love to add that to the site as well. Okay, so I am going to be talking about uh, Voyant, or Voyant, uh, which is a really useful uh, text analysis tool. And basically, Voyant is something that you can use um, either on a browser um, or on your own computer. And it allows you to either copy and paste or upload um, text files. Um, and it provides you, after you do that, a really good, clear breakdown of word frequencies, of collocations, um, of words in texts. And it also provides you with some pretty um, dazzling um, options for data visualizations, right, which are really um, kind of colorful and, and fun. So this is how it works. So you would go to um, Voyant. And actually, I just it's worth noting that Voyant has been in development at least since 2008. Before it was Voyant, it was uh, Tapor, which some of you might have been familiar with. Um, and it's headed uh, by two researchers in Canada, one who is at McGill, the other who is at um, Alberta. Um, so it really is a kind of long-term labor of love. And I have to say, I do remember using Taper in earlier days and, and never was able to get the hang of it. But Voyant is extremely user-friendly. So here, uh, what you would do, this is their very simple streamlined interface. Um, you would um, either upload or paste a text into that box. And you can actually upload multiple text files, which, make, which makes it pretty useful. Um, but it's also worth noting that even though this is not what I use Voyant for, you can actually use tabular data. You can upload uh, spreadsheets, you can upload comma-separated value um, information, and it will work with that as well. But I'm a literature um, scholar, and so I use it for studying literary, studying literary texts. So once you do upload that text or paste that text in there, and it really is that simple, you can, um, you'll see a whole kind of interface of information about the text that you've just uploaded. And then you can choose different outputs in terms of your visualizations. Here is a, um, oh, that's not showing up very well at all. But um, this is a bubble line. This actually kind of looks like a decorative part of the PowerPoint, but <laughs> um, it is actually um, one of the options you have for data visualization in Voyant. And what it does is, just as this definition uh, tells you, that um, it represents each word in the document according to um, uh, the size and color of a circle. The larger the circle, the more frequently that word appears. And in some ways, this is not very helpful because just by looking at it, you don't know what the words are. But it does provide an interesting pattern. What it shows you is that, um, I'll just hop over here for a second, that this blue circle here is about the same size as this one and this one, right? And so what it does is kind of create um, a pattern of um, a distribution that might be worth looking at. Even though you don't know what the word is, it might start or provoke some interesting research questions. 
This one is much more familiar. I think all of us have seen um, the word cloud. Same principle, except in this one, you see what the word is. The larger the word, the more frequently it appears. And I'll talk about this particular text um, in just a moment. Um, and so this is their Cirrus option. And they have many other options for visualization. But one thing that Voyant also provides <laughs> excuse me, um, is a gallery or an opportunity to upload images um, from your own searches that will help future scholars who are trying to decide how they might best make use of Voyant uh, in their own work. And this was one that I found in their gallery that I found pretty provocative. This is someone who did, um, his research focus was on post-apocalyptic fiction, science fiction, and how cities were represented in these stories. And he um, has a really large uh, corpus of texts about this topic. And what he did is he had a hunch, I think, that um, concerns about the apocalypse um, in the latter half of the 20th century might have a different tenor or tone than earlier stories about the apocalypse. And sure enough, when he um, tested this by loading all of these documents into Voyant, what he found is that the terms, the adjectives environmental and nuclear became affixed to war in a way that they had not been previously. Right? And that makes perfect sense historically in terms of things that are happening during that time period. But this is a really um, handy, I think, uh, provocation and conversation starter about the topic that he had in mind. So in my own work, I'm interested in how um, um, natural ecologies are represented in science fiction, um, as well as how technologies are represented um, in science fiction and, and together in particular. But for this presentation, I thought I would focus on one small, smaller subset of that larger concern, which is the relationship between human and animals um, in early science fiction. So I look at two texts here at first. The first is uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells. And that's what that bubble line was actually from. And that's what that word cloud was actually from. And so what I did was um, in Voyant, you can actually pick the words you want Voyant to search for, which is extremely useful. You don't have to um, use their um, massive list of word frequencies. You can tell it which words to look for. And you can also edit your stop words list, right? So um, that is also an extremely uh, useful, um, easy thing to do that Voyant provides. And so what I found by looking at the island of Dr. Moreau is that uh, pretty clearly um, the word man is used more frequently throughout the novel than the word animal is. However, there are a couple of sections in the novel where that frequency is reversed. And so right here, for example, is a, a kind of a rich section. And so I kind of zoomed in on that. And with Voyant, you can look at their reader, which will tell you where that particular occurrence of those words occurred. And if you're familiar with this uh, novel by H.G. Wells, this actually makes perfect sense. This is the moment that Montgomery, the main character who has thought all along that Moreau has been changing human beings into animals, realizes the reverse, that in fact he has been making animals into some kind of gross approximation of, of human consciousness. And so it's kind of helpful because it sort of displays an interesting reversal in frequency that's worth further attention. I also looked at Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and entered the same search terms. And here a similar pattern emerges. And so you have much more uh, frequent use of the word man than the, the word animal. But in this section, uh, the third section, you see that they are, <coughs> excuse me, um, very close if not identical in terms of frequency. And so if you go to that section, you can see that Shelley is actually talking about uh, human beings. Um, Victor, in his research, Victor Frankenstein, says that um, one of the phenomena which had really attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame and indeed any animal imbued with life. Um, and that's pretty interesting because in this instance at least, um, the human is actually a subset of the animal according to Shelley's sort of epistemology and ontology. And that is another instance that kind of provokes further conversation, I think. And it's also worth noting that uh, one thing that is a perpetual problem with any of these things that we're talking about in terms of text analysis is anytime you have a typo, right? So um, endued with life, that should be you know, endowed with life. Um, this is something that, uh, this is a Gutenberg file, so you're dealing with kind of problems with cleaning uh, your data uh, as well. And 
the, 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 the cool thing, too, about Voyant, as I said, is that you can um, upload multiple files. So just to show you what that can provide, uh, Gutenberg also has a free collection of um, the complete pulp magazines from Amazing Stories from 1930. So I uploaded those 12 issues and just did the same kind of simple search in terms of frequency of word occurrence. And what I found was that the word said was the most um, prominent, most frequently used word. And this is not at all surprising. Uh, early science fiction is very talky, right? It's very expository. Um, but what's cool about Voyant is that it can let you see who's doing the talking. So you can go through these instances and see who is in fact speaking. And, and in one particular story, The Planet of Dread <laughs> from August 1930, um, this is, a, I think, a pretty indicative uh, type of story in terms of who is doing the speaking and the power relations that um, the story reveals. Um, primarily, the speakers in these stories are all uh, are, are primarily masculine. And in this case, uh, you even have a literal master and servant relationship in this story um, that speaks to a lot of the problems of uh, the ideolo ideology behind colonization that was really prominent in early science fiction. Okay. So um, those are some of the things that you can do uh, with Voyant. It's a really useful, user-friendly tool. I would say that there are a couple of, um, I would offer a couple of caveats um, about it. The first is a, um, a technical caveat. The second is more of a philosophic one. Um, the technical caveat is this. You can use Voyant freely from your browser, and um, it will sometimes work beautifully, and other times it will just hang. Right, and so uh, a solution to this is that you can, in fact, uh, run Voyant locally on your own machine. You simply have to download it, um, and that solves a lot of that problem. The other issue, I think, has to do with this statement. You can see through the text, right? Uh, Voyant, um, in French, I'm not a French speaker, but I looked it up just to make sure that I had this right. Um, it, it can mean of seeing, but it also has this kind of sense of clairvoyance, and the tagline for Voyant, see through your text, speaks to this kind of um, idea or dream about transparency, I think, that um, is a false dream, right? Um, so I would use Voyant to provoke questions rather than uh, looking for simple transparencies or solutions to them, and I just kind of offer that as a, as a caveat. So with that, thank you very much, and please do be in touch if you would like to be a part of the RIG. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. So before we get into q and I have my own shameless plug. Um, for the Utah Symposium on the Digital Humanities, you guys have probably all heard about this, but it bears repeating because it's going to be a really great, great two days. Uh, we have a great keynote by Alan Liu. We have workshop and consultations from Perry Collins, who is a program officer from NEH's Office of Digital Humanities. There will be panel presentations. It's going to be really great. And that registration is currently open. Uh, if you need more information, just ask me or David Rowe, who is my co-chair. And now, um, let me just, uh, I want to thank our presenters one more time because they did a really great job. And I'm going to open the floor up for questions, if anyone has any. Should I take this one? Okay. So I'm excited about Zotero, and I'm, I'm going to start teaching a slick, and I want to introduce it to the students. But many of them will be needing to use the computers at the school. So I understand you download it to your home computer. I understand how you do it there. But what if you're working on the library's computers? That is a really good question. Um, so there is, like I said, there's the two parts. There's the web-based version. Well, there's really three. But as far as managing your library, there's the web-based and then the application. So if they go in and create a Zotero account and build their library in the web-based version, that they can open anywhere they go. So they could you know, start building items. Now, the problem is you don't have the single click functionality that you have in the application. Um, and the application would live on the computer. Correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but I believe you'd only be able to use the web-based one if they weren't using their own. And since it would be a public computer, they probably wouldn't want to keep their username and password. I don't even think it would let them use their username and password, you know, keeping it in there. So most likely they would just have to use Zotero.org, build their library there, and then they could open it on any of their own devices, you know, if they have a, an iPhone or a tablet or something. Uh, but they wouldn't have the full functionality of having it on their computer. If they do have an iPhone or tablet, it works on that also, and they could do the application there. Just like their own. Mm -hmm. 
because technically that is their own computer. So it's always easier to do this work on a laptop, but if they have their own tablet or their own iPhone, they can download it there and do that work. It's just a lot smaller. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question for Brian. Uh, there you are. Um, can you make WordPress private, or can you have a smaller group just using it for the class and not have it public? I have a question for Justin, actually. Um, so if, if I were teaching a class and wanted to do some kind of map-based program, something to get students started, and they had collected data, maybe they had a spreadsheet of you know, geographic information, I mean, what would you suggest for kind of an entry-level geospatial uh, project that students could work on? Uh, so the one that I would usually say is the easiest to start with is Google Earth. It's very user friendly. We have a lot of tutorials available on the library's website. You can check out there. A uh, step up that's just before you get into the professional ArcGIS platform is ArcGIS Online. It's a little bit more, you know, some features require subscriptions, some don't. So you can actually create a free account with that. And one of the nice features with that is you can upload a spreadsheet like a CSV file. So if you had locations on the map that you wanted to work with, uh, it'll actually geocode those and plot those on the map. So it's a great tool to get started with as well. So. This question is for Anna. Uh, similar to the first question, it's not entirely clear to me where Omeka lives. Is it an online application? Is it one that you download to your computer? And where do the projects live? Are they are, are they stored on your home computer? How, how would you imagine that working in this type of academic environment? So Omeka can work in a variety of ways. Um, Omeka has a site called Omeka.net, which functions very similarly to WordPress.com, where you can set up your own site on that server and your files and your project will just live there online with um, an omeko.net URL. The only problem with that is that they really restrict the file size for the number of files that you can um, upload to that. So it might work really well for um, maybe a simple undergraduate project that might not have a ton of images, but then if you were wanting to get into it um, and host your own site, it's basically software that you would need to have installed on a web server. And there are some web hosts that work with Omeka that can do that. Um, the library's in the middle of kind of a pilot project evaluating Omeka, so I can't make any promises, but you know, there might, there might be some options there in the future. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at is um, some software that's still in beta called Omeka S, which allows people more easily to manage multiple instances of Omeka. But it's something that right now, if you were sitting on this campus and wanting to get an Omeka site up and running, I think your main options would be commercial web hosting or that Omeka.net site. Um, and the files wouldn't really live on their, your computer. They'd all be just web published. And also, if you have questions about digital humanities tools in general, you know, the now would be a good time to ask them. Don't feel like you have to ask a specific question about Omeka or Zotero or Voyant. Another question about Zotero. So if you have a list with, um, if you have a bibliography, can you upload that and it makes individual entries in Sotero? So does the reverse also work or can you only go from Sotero to a bibliography? That is a great question. That's one I've gotten uh, multiple times. Unfortunately, uh, you can't go in reverse because it has to be structured information. Um, the beauty of Zotero is it's been told this is an author, this is a title, this is a publisher. Um, and when you have just a free text bibliography, that structured information isn't there. 
Um, you can actually, by the way, drag and drop from Zotero. Again, it's not even just the plugin, but you can drag and drop a whole folder and it creates a bibliography. But unfortunately, it has to get the information in a structured form, uh, which it does online, but it can't do from like a Word document. I'm still thinking about the web or the piece, the home computer. So what happens if the computer drops in the bathtub and you, do you lose your entire Zotero? How do you get it back? And how do you move it when you buy a new laptop? <laughs> um, that is such a great question and they do a great job of, um, you know, making sure that doesn't happen. So, and, and also there are steps you can take to make sure that doesn't happen. So uh, your library lives, it's cloud-based. So even if you drop your computer in the ocean and nothing works, um, you'll lose your application, you know, it was there, but your library still lives in the cloud, in Zotero's servers. Um, and there are things that you can do to make yourself feel better, and I'll, I'll show you really quickly. Um, so, as I said, I'm the data librarian. I care very much about data loss. And so something you can do if you have a Zotero library is you go to the preferences, you go to advanced, um, I think it's advanced, files and folders, and then it says show data directory. That is your Zotero library. That's everything that exists in there. That's all 3,400 of my, my um, beautiful metadata records and notes and files and PDFs. Um, once a month, I back that up on my own U-Box. So just in case, you know, and it's not just um, your computer crashing. I mean, if Zotero goes out of business tomorrow, I want to make sure I still have that library. And that's actually a very exportable library. I could pick the whole thing up and move it to EndNote or move it to some other tool tomorrow. Um, I would just do it in a RIF file, which is pretty, um, you know, it's, it works across multiple platforms. So I think it's, it's never a good idea to be too married to one tool because tools come and go. So always have a backup plan for exporting your data and putting it somewhere else, especially if you've worked really hard on, you know, making your own personal library. Um, so, so you wouldn't have to worry about that. Zotero backs it up, but it's nice to take extra steps also to make sure your data is, you know, secure. I had a question for Lizzie and uh, regarding R. So, so for some people, the R Studio might look like a pretty intimidating interface because it's got so many boxes and windows and small type. Um, so, what is a, a, a low barrier entry point for someone interested in, in playing with R? Is there like a website or some kind of repository of packages that you can use to uh, just start playing around without the fear of breaking your machine? Well, you don't have to be afraid of breaking your machine. Nothing you do on R will hurt your machine <laughs> um, or your text themselves. So if you've got a bunch of text files and you're like, I'm going to play with them, but nothing you do in R will change anything that exists in those files. It all happens um, within the R space. Um, I just learned by picking up the Jockers book, um, uh, analysis, textual analysis in R for students of literature. And uh, he has online, it's a, it's a whole um, package with his texts that he uh, leads you through um, examples about what to do uh, with, I think it's uh, Moby Dick and uh, an Austin book. And um, so that was a really good step-by-step hand-holding way to uh, start out. And then um, I also recommend as you're, as you're doing that, don't just work on his texts. Get a couple of your own that you're actually interested in the questions in with, um, but do his analyses and use the code he has you type in on your own texts because um, it will just inherently seem more interesting to you. I'm going to ask a follow up to David's question. So there's a lot of programming languages out there, and and I've wondered, you know. Should I learn Python? Should I learn R? I mean, if you're interested in digital humanities, would you say R is probably the preferable programming language to learn because it's easy or useful or some other good quality? Let's co-answer this because you know <laughs> <laughs> Java, right? And Python? Python? Um, I don't know. Well, how did you choose? Hello. Um, <laughs> um, so I actually, I started with R at the same book that Lizzie used, and I made it through chapter two. Um, and I got a lot out of it, but it's true, he provides this amazing corpus of Melville text, right, Moby Dick, and I just wasn't, um, I, the data actually was not as clean as it could have been too, so I was having problems with that. Um, 
but I actually learned a little bit of R through DHSI at University of Victoria, and what I found super useful and very easy was to use their Stylo package, um, which allows you to kind of do authorship attribution, and it gives you um, keywords and will print out the kind of collocations that um, Voyant will do as well. Um, and so that was actually very user-friendly. Um, but I, um, I decided to learn Python um, because of their um, natural language processing toolkit and um, a kind of lighter version of that, which is called Text Blob. <laughs> it's really elegant. Um, <laughs> um, and so the, the thing that I found that I was telling this to Lizzie before we started is that some of the things that, I, that were really hard earned <laughs> in Python, I can do in Voyant. <laughs> And, um, but the visualizations that I can do um, with Python, maybe I can't do with Voyant, but the same kind of counting um, is definitely something that a user-friendly interface like Voyant would do. But for the things that Lizzie does, like topic modeling, um, I think um, R or Mallet, right, mm -hmm. would be your, your best bet. That's amazing. So, um, so I think my understanding of Python is maybe not complete. I thought it was a database language. Is no, that not use, true? You can oh. For and oh, and in fact, I would say that like my knowledge of Python is so specific to these uh, textual questions that I don't know Python. I'm not a programmer, um, but I have become pretty savvy at like recycling other code and making it work for my own purposes. <laughs> um, but um, certainly, that's not the only language that you could use to do that kind of text analysis. Yeah, I think I um, initially chose R just because it did seem um, so to have so many different functions um, that you could use. I also um, I'm in environmental humanities, so I have had many collaborations with ecologists and biologists, and all of them use R to make all their <laughs> um, their graphs that I and I would see them making these beautiful graphs for these papers and um, thinking like, oh, well, I want to do that, but I kind of want to emphasize these other things. Um, so not only was I kind of inspired by that as a, it, it's sort of just a standard tool, I think, in the sciences. Um, and, uh, but also then I had a community of people who I could ask questions about R when I did run into, when run into problems. So that's how I ended up there. Hi, I have a, a general question for anyone who has maybe used or introduced these um, web publishing or content management sites in the classroom. I'm thinking about integrating it into some of my own classes, but I've never done it before. So what are the, the kind of ethical and legal set of protocols around using student work and publishing it to the, this is a really basic question, <laughs> but like if, if, so if I have things that are living on Canvas now with the understanding that at some point it might be living elsewhere on the web, do I need to then inform the students if this happens after the class that the content is going live? Or do I need to, is, is permission granted like in perpetuity once you agree to do something like this? I don't have so much of an answer to this as the fact that this question came up here in the library uh, within the last couple of weeks, and there are a couple of us who are exploring the possibility of Marriott Library leading the way in developing a template for university faculty to present to their students within the syllabus or at the beginning of the semester saying, these are projects you're working on, uh, whether it's a solo project or a group project, and asking them for uh, a signature of some sort to then uh, deposit these digital objects into the institutional repository uh, and uh, giving informed consent as much as we can inform them, as much as we can predict uh, that these objects would then be made publicly available. They could be used for research, they could be used as data, uh, depending on how, uh, whatever project that they're developing somebody who finds it in the institutional repository may then eventually be citing that object. More to come. Does anyone else have any questions? Either for our presenters or you just want to throw out and see if someone has an answer to? Okay. 
then with that, I think we can leave 10 minutes early. And thank you so much for coming today and braving the storm and making it to the library. Thank you. <laughs>